I'm not even hungry. I'm that depressed. <laughs> I'm just depressed enough to want to just eat my feelings. <laughs> I'm the other way. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another episode of Wasted Local Talent. How's it going, Daniel? It's going. <laughs> we really got to stop recording these intros on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Steelers lost. Yeah. Cowboys are down 17 and a half time. Yeah, 17 to nothing. Mason Rudolph doesn't know what day of the week it is. No. Oh. And, and leave he, it to the Steelers to have a, a faulty uh, cart on the sideline. So oh. he had to walk off the field after that hit. <laughs> That's how I feel about right now. It was about like that cart. We got other podcasts on the network. We do. 13 Palm Trees. Um <laughs> We sound so depressed Shoot. and defeated. <laughs> yeah, this, listen to D&D Kinda and listen to Video Game Mythos and Gurus of Gaming and check out our fantasy football podcast that's out every Tuesday right here on Wasted Local Talent. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we're going bi-weekly. Yeah. We might actually be taking a, a short hiatus because... Yet again, we're in that rut where um, people are no showing. So I'm I'm in a bad mood, mm. but you know what? <laughs> we're both in bad moods. Who do we have on this week? We have Jason Lennox, and this again. is a really good interview. Yeah, I'm happy with this. Yeah. Sorry, Jason. I don't mean to. I mean, I'm in a bad mood, but your interview is really great. Yeah. So he's probably listening to this right now. Like, <laughs> like gosh, man, those guys are depressing. But no, this would be like uh, actually. I think during the interview, I said it would be the third time that he's been on, but it's actually the fourth because he sat down last year at PopCon. So that's a record. And and he had his own interview, and then he sat down again this year at PopCon, and told us about his Kickstarter for um, his comic book that's coming out. And yeah, so I told him to jump back on to help him promote that a little bit. Yeah, and that is uh, we go into detail about that a little bit. That is opening this week. Yeah, the 12th. The 12th. Mm -hmm. So Kickstarter, look it up. Yeah, and check out Jason Lennox on Facebook, Instagram, website, all that stuff. It'll be linked below. We're going to link all that stuff. Yeah, and uh, don't forget to check out Worst Kept Secret. And thank you for letting us use Bender. That's the best part of my day. It's like uh, Folgers. The best part of waking up is Bender in my ear holes. All right. I yeah. thought last week was the worst intro that we've ever done. No. This is the worst intro that we've I am ever done. I was such a high because my fantasy team wrecked house. And then Dallas comes out and literally lays the giant, the most giant turd egg of a first half that I've probably watch them play in a long time at least you have hope there's still a whole second half there is a whole second half i have nothing a, a whole second half to make it 34 to nothing i have a third string quarterback <laughs> you're right but kudos to him for coming out and almost beating him. dude he was balling he was he was he played really well Dev I, duck dynasty quack quack <laughs> anyway <laughs> here's our interview yeah here's jason lennox uh go cowboys So what's up, everybody? I'm Daniel. And I'm Jed. I'm Josiah. And today we're wasting our talent yet again with... Jason Lennox. How's it going, guys? Good. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm having a fine Sunday. My wife and I were outside of our new kitchen, black tarring the foundation. So it was a hot, a hot morning. Oh, that does not Mary sound Cuppel enjoyable. With, yeah. With five gallons of black tar oh. in a trench around the new foundation just slathering on tar that sounds awful i mean it, it seems like a good time of year to do that but not whenever it's like 80 some degrees outside still so <laughs> there may never be a good time to slather tar on well. cinder blocks but today <laughs> wasn't too bad because it wasn't freezing or ridiculously hot it yeah. was about 60 degrees so oh, that's good it's all done it sounds oh, it's like the newest after atlas song <laughs> <laughs> Sl slathering, slathering tar slathering tar <laughs> yes facts so Tell us what's going on. What's so, new? So the biggest thing going on for me right now is I begin the uh, probably way too long, way too annoying press junket for it is new comic books coming to Kickstarter. So 
it's going to launch October 12th for Lords of the Cosmos issue three. So um, I was on uh, on Wasted Local Town to talk about the issues one and two. So you've graciously had me back to help plug and promote and talk about Lords of the Cosmos on Kickstarter. So that's the biggest thing going on for me right now. All right. And when does uh, the Kickstarter begin? October 12th. October 12th. And so this is going to be out, obviously, if, you know, a little bit before that to give you some promotion for it. And we'll link everything in the bio. So if you're listening out there, everything's going to be linked below. So uh, so tell us about Lord of the Cosmos 3 and the process behind it and how you decided to go ahead and jump on the third edition so soon. Well, boy, I tell you, I wish it was too soon. It seems like it's <laughs> yeah. taken forever. It seems like it's taken forever. Um, you know, self-publishing comic books is the equivalent of writing a semester-long project term paper. I don't know if thesis is the correct uh, example, but uh, they're big, multi-layered uh, efforts with lots of people helping. And not only uh, in my role do you have to be creating art and writing, but then your manager role. Mm-hmm. So you're coordinating about 16 people towards a common goal. And, uh, you know, this issue's had uh, a lot of <clears throat> a lot of trials and tribulations, and it's it's going to be really exciting. But it's been a lot of work, and we're in the home stretch of the book right now. It's not 100% done, but it's it's very close. So, you know, I, I figured it was about time to get, it to, to get it going. So we've been working on the book for about the last year, and then the last – Mm, three months we've really put our noses to the grindstone to to really bring it to uh, a finish line Mm -hmm. and you know i find that for a lot of creatives uh you know where they can get burned is that there's a lot of initial excitement about doing something and then there's a lot of accolades and that's really cool and excitement and then there's the long realization that it's a big slog to get to the end and i and not everyone but I think a lot of people get turned away by that and and then a project may start and it just goes nowhere or is never completed. Uh, I try to be, uh, I try to be focused on the goal to get these projects done to the point where they can be presented to the public. And then, you know, once we raise the money, we'll, we'll move to close it in the next couple of months and get the books out to people. Yeah. I think it's a really smart way to do it. Uh, cause we were talking at, at PopCon about how you put your coloring book, um, on the not not necessarily the back burner, but you're you're going to focus on this first. So you don't you're not one you're not working on two separate projects at the same time, but that yeah. way you could put all your focus onto one, and then once that's out, then you could focus on the coloring book as well. Yeah, and I think well, and where Lords of the Cosmos three went, and I had to make an executive decision on it. It was it was spiraling into too big of a book, and I had to be like. Uh, the guy that cut the Gordian knot. So we actually have issue four is about halfway done uh, now too. So uh, what was going on was this book was just blowing up to be like a 70 page book and that was getting out of control. So I just had to make an executive decision to like slice it in half Mm -hmm. and then add a little bit of content to the next issue. So I'm going to do issue three, issue four, I'm thinking late spring 2020 and then, you know, satanic coloring book after that. But to your point, with any of these projects, um, there has to be a little tunnel vision and a little bit of compartmentalization because mm-hmm. you're right. If you if you try to, well, I'm going to have you know this, that, and and all at the same time, it doesn't get done. Yeah. So you're right. Like there's a lot of work we'd have to do with the coloring book that right now is just it's a bookmark. It's it's on the shelf. Uh, it needs to be the focus of my attention at the right time. Mm-hmm. now's not that time now's lords of the cosmos three and then you know again to bring that to completion and then like i said fortunately with some of the stuff that has already been done that was written initially for issue three i've just pushed it forward to issue four mm-hmm. so like i said that book's about halfway done and so when do you when do you plan on three coming out and then obviously four as well since you said it's about halfway done so what will happen is we'll wrap the Kickstarter for issue three, probably sometime, you know, whatever, November 11th or 12th. Mm-hmm. And then my, I, I put in the Kickstarter that everyone would have their books by June 2020, which I felt was a very conservative goal. Uh, I'd like to have done a lot sooner than that, mm-hmm. but I like to put in very, very low obstacles to get over. Yeah. And my plan is as we look to ship those books to start prepping Lords of the Cosmos for to go right on to Kickstarter a little bit after that. So I'll kind of have to watch how it goes. 
but to really kind of tag those one after the other. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, so again, I'm thinking, you know, people can get their books by like April. Maybe we launch Lords of the Cosmos for like, you know, May, June, mm-hmm. and then have that out by like late, you know, late summer ish. Yeah. So back to back, like one right after the other. Yeah. And, and I saw a guy um, that a friend tipped me off to that does a book called Miskatonic University, kind of like a high school uh, student's take on the Cthulhu mythos where this this is a guy that he's knocking out books pretty quick. And, I, I, you know, you, you watch other people that are successful and that guy seems very successful with what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And he's stacking Kickstarters pretty quick where they seem to be like, you know, every couple months. Uh, I'm not to that point yet, but, uh, you know, if, if you can line them up that they can go, I think people are into it because, you know, I've had a lot of people saying, where's issue three, where's issue three. Hmm. So, you know, the, the, the people like the first two books, so they want more. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, they're used to big publishing companies knocking out a book every, you know, every, every couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, personal and financial resources involved in that level of productivity. Obviously, I'm not there yet, but if we could get a book out pretty quick, I, I, it'd be fun, I think. You know, it kind of really keep the excitement rolling. Yeah, definitely. Talk about the importance of using Kickstarter, where you're answering 100% to your fan base and mm-hmm. also to yourself, as opposed to maybe a publishing company where they might change kind of the creative side of what you want to do. So you're your own boss. So with Kickstarter, you are accountable to the fans. Um, And it's a very democratic way to be held accountable um, because one, Kickstarters are never able to be removed or edited once they close. Mm -hmm. So if you act like a jerk um, and you do a bad job of servicing your fans, you will get tarred and feathered by them as you should. Oh, and then what happens is it's just there where people could say, hmm, Jason's done nine Kickstarters. This will be my 10th. Um, what do people say? And they can go in the comments and they can see, is it is it a, a big red rash of negativity or is it professionally answered questions and people being happy? Um, with issue two, there was a lull in the publishing process where we were having some problems with some page files. and I didn't do an update for a couple of weeks. And there was a young lady that was like, why no updates? Hmm. <laughs> and you know, I said, yeah, I said, well, you know what, here's everything that's going on. Then I did an update for everybody with, I answered all of her questions. Yeah. I remember she was like, good, you know, thank you. And, uh, you know, she was a person that gave us money and she had a valid question. And I just didn't really think what I had to say was really important at that time, but people seemed to think it was. So I, I wrote, this is a plan. These are the dates and this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Um, you know, again, if they give money, they should have a right to ask. Oh, exactly. Um, whereas with a publisher, it's kind of like I'm beholden to one person. Yeah. Uh, which is a different, which is a different, you know, relationship where you're kind of at the whim of one person versus, you know, a democratic group. Um, I like the fans. Um, I've always tried to go out of my way to treat them well. Um, I, you know, I, I think I think I've done a very good job from doing nine Kickstarters of being very true to the goals of each project and taking care of the backers to make sure that they were, they got things uh, in a timely manner as promised. Mm -hmm. Um, Bleeding cool ran a really wild article this year about 39 Kickstarters that had done that had never been fulfilled. I, I, I read it and it was really amazing to see some of the money that, you know, people had given to some projects, some of which were pretty high profile that, have never been fulfilled years and years later. And uh, I, I hate seeing that because I hate seeing good people, you know, invest in these create creative projects and, and being let down. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, it should be my goal to exceed their expectations and make them happy that they invested their, their hard earned money uh, to support my ideas. So to me, it's, it's a very important trust and it's an important promise, uh, you know, a, a, really it's a contract between, you know, the creator in Kickstarter to all those people, whether it's, Hey, I gave you $5 to get a PDF or, you know, I, I spent hundreds of dollars to get original art. Um, mm-hmm. They all should be treated with the same level of respect. Oh, absolutely. And so with Kickstarter, um, kind of go over you know, like the, the tiers and different things. I don't know if you have those set up for your own thing, but just in general. And 
as far as like the, the money side of things, like does it come out beforehand? Does it come out once you've reached a goal or how does all that work? So Kickstarter, and I, this is, again, this is my 10th one. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like a bizarre game show about you. <laughs> it's about your popularity <laughs> and what your value is to the public. So what I mean by that is if you took, like, let's, let's take an industry veteran. Like, let's take someone like George Perez, right? Yeah. He's been making books for decades. Uh, he's universally beloved, and he's probably done, you know, thousands of appearances, right? Mm-hmm. So if George Perez said, I would like to get $80,000 for a project, probably could do it because his popularity based on this uh, just a tremendous amount of work and time and, and, you know, kissing babies and shaking hands, you know, he could probably do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I just had some friends that were talking to me the other weekend about doing their first books on Kickstarter. And my advice to them was keep it low 500 bucks to a thousand bucks. And they were like, why? And I, I threw the George Perez example out to them and I said, you know, but you got to shoot your goals lower because you're like way lower in the trough, but hit a goal you can hit. Yeah. Because the crazy thing mm-hmm. about Kickstarter is if let's say I went out and said, I want $80,000 because I think George Perez could get it. Um, I would fall very, very fall uh, short of that goal mm-hmm. because George Perez is, you know, many, many levels above me in the, in the popularity, reputation, skill game. So, you know, his, his value uh, is, would be much higher. And I'm just using George as an example of someone that's just off the top of my head. Yeah. So where guys can get their, their butt in a ringer is that they'll come out and say, hey, I, I have never done one before. and I'd like $30,000. That doesn't seem and, very... <laughs> well, and, and, and they'll do it. And mm-hmm. then, you know, they'll get like two or three of their friends to pledge 25 bucks. And then they'll typically just shut their Kickstarter down. It'll never be removed. It's like a black mark on their name Yeah. because Kickstarter gives you nothing unless you hit your goal. Okay. I wish I had two or three friends that would give me 25 bucks. (laughs) Right. So that's the reason I counseled my friends the other week that are new to it. I'm like, just go for a very low goal because what you want is a win. Mm -hmm. Cause you can set your goal, whatever you want. You can say, I want 500 bucks. I want a hundred thousand dollars. You know, I want a half a million dollars. I want $5,000. And the only goal you have is to hit the goal you set, Mm -hmm. which again, which is kind of like, it's like a game show where it's like, you'll get all your money if you hit the goal. Mm -hmm. So how much is your popularity worth? Did you go out and do conventions? Did you talk to people? Did you, did you answer questions? Were you positive on social media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for this book, I set the goal at $4,000. It's a realistic number. We won't have a a problem to exceed. Hopefully we can go over the goal. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is the campaign will, will close. And then after a day or two, you'll get a communication from PayPal that'll say, hey, uh, everything's processing. Uh, you'll be receiving a payment for X less their fees because they got to make a buck, too. Yeah. Yeah. Now, sometimes, like, let's say you, you back the project for twenty dollars, but let's say you shut your credit card down before they bill you. Mm hmm. If you fall below your goal because of things like that, they won't penalize you because that's not your fault. So if it drops below, if so, if say if you have a five hundred dollar goal, and one mm-hmm. one payment doesn't clear, so it drops it below that, you'll still get it because that's not you as the creator's fault. Correct. I mean, you wouldn't PayPal wouldn't front that money, but they wouldn't like terminate the goal because John Smith's credit card failed. Yeah. Okay. So. You know, so you'll you'll lose some fees, and then you know, as you budget, you have to take into account things like shipping and production costs. So there's a little bit of thought and math you got to put into it. But again, you have to look at all these things as a a very honest and stark look at you and how popular you are to your fans, and can you get new fans and getting strangers to give you money? Mm-hmm. And overestimating it too far can cause you to get nothing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if so you, you set your goal at four, you said 4,000 for the Lord of the Cosmos three, correct? Correct. correct. And you also, you, you actually, you go out to a lot of different cons and things and meet people and talk to people and your fans. Um, mm-hmm. What's the next con that you'll be at? Baltimore Comic Con, which is October 18th, 19th, and 20th. Okay. And yeah. 
And that's whenever you, like, that's your big, you know, push for your, your Kickstarter. And I just had a question for, for you, for our podcast company. Are you going to be at Steel City Con this year? I will not. I did that show years ago and, and I, I, I'll be honest, I, I just didn't have the best time at it. So mm -hmm. I just, I, I did it years ago uh, once and I just haven't gone back. Okay. We were just curious because I think, I think, Jed, are we doing? Yeah, we're, we're going to go this year. Yeah, we're, we were going to go up there. So we're going to see if you were going to be up there as well. Uh, but anyway, back to, uh, back to the Kickstarter and everything. <laughs> so, I actually, with Baltimore, go ahead. I, I, go ahead. What's your question? Yeah, I had a question for you, Jason, about, uh, so the project that you're working on now, I know you ended up splitting it into, uh, Two releases. Mm -hmm. Did you kind of have an idea going into it that that was maybe going to happen, or was it just kind of like once you started putting pen to paper, so to speak, um, it just took off in a direction? That's a great question. Uh, that was not planned. Um, sometimes these things just go in directions that you can't predict, and some of the stories started just getting bigger and bigger as we were making them, and we didn't want to shut down the writers and artists and like try to curtail their creativity. Cool. So again, as these things started to grow, um, you know, now some people will take a tack and, and, and really cut it, cut it, cut it. No, 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 no. Uh, to me, when I see creative, either writers or visual artists and they're on a roll and they're making great stuff, I tend to say, go, go, go. And like, we'll figure that out later. <laughs> and fi figuring it out later was like, okay, so we're going to push this down the road a little bit. Not, mm -hmm. we're going to get rid of it. It's like, it just can't be here. Yeah, but we'll put it there. So no, that actually just kind of happened organically, and you know it it came because you know Dennis and Jason and I, the the three you know creators and owners of Lords of the Cosmos, we just didn't want to shut down all the good stuff that was being made. We're like, go go do do more and more. Do you need more pages? Do it, do it, do it, do it. No, I mean that, that so, makes sense because you know once if you try to stifle that, like you don't want to kill that because if it's if they're on a roll and they're they're coming up with good stuff, as long as it's good stuff, you know, um, why yes. why stop them? Like let them go. Well, why? Because you're you know you're going to be a slave to saying this can only be so many pages and whatever. But like I said, I mean, p part of doing something like this is you have plans and goals, but you also have to be flexible enough to understand. Okay, I know this is what our, was our original plan, but something happened. I got to change. And then, you know, we had a discussion amongst ourselves to say what was the plan. And we did an informal survey of people that back all the books and said, would you be more excited for one big book or two small books? And they're all like, two smaller books. It's more issues. <laughs> so, you know, we, we did some surveying to find out that the people that are giving us money wanted that more. Mm -hmm. We said, okay, that's actually easier for us to do anyway. So we'll do that. Now, have you had any major switch ups coming into this project that you like your illustrators and your writers, or is it pretty much the same crew? Uh, another great question. So uh, there were some changes. Um, we, we had um, a new artist join us for this book for uh, the robot plant story. Mm -hmm. uh, Zach, who was a young guy that I met, his name is Zach Snyder, not the director. Um, <laughs> I got met me him excited at Keystone. <laughs> well, right. Yeah. <laughs> but we got, uh, we got him. I met him at Keystone Comic Con in Philadelphia last, um, October and a really nice young guy, and really hungry to draw stuff, super talented. Uh, and I, I needed someone to fill the spot and I reached out to him and he, you know, took our bizarre plant world vision from the plant kingdoms of the far past of Lords of the Cosmos, and he he, he really knocked it out of the park. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, he's a totally new guy to us. Uh, and then Dave Newbold has drawn stuff in the other two issues. So he's doing uh, one of the other uh, – there's three stories in the book, and he's doing the third one, which is uh, called Bug with a Shotgun, which is about a wasp that uh, – has to take up arms to defend his homeland uh, against Umex and his his bad guys in the Lords of the Cosmos universe. Yeah. So Dave's a returning favorite, and Zach is a new player to the team. So a little bit of new, a little bit of old. Um, 
My friend Eric has built another toy for the back of the issue, so he has built another custom toy. So they're working on getting that photographed in the next couple of weeks so we have more original toy packaging for the back of the uh, comic because everyone seems to like our toys we keep making for the book. And then uh, I did the uh, art for the main story, which picks up right with the cliffhanger from the last issue and ends mm-hmm. on another cliffhanger. So I, I've kind of gone the old Flash Gordon route that every story has to resolve a cliffhanger and end on a cliffhanger to keep things hot. Yeah, I I like that approach to any kind of story. Like storyboarding is, you want to, I as like a, a reader or like you know somebody that watches movies or TV shows or whatever, like ending something on a cliffhanger. I mean, as a consumer, it's like man, that sucks, but keeps you wanting more and want to know what's next. So I, as you know, a a creator, I feel like that's a really smart move to do. Right. Now the other stories in the book tend to have more of a finite ending, whereas Mm -hmm. my story seems to be like the, the main, you know, again, resolution cliffhanger, Mm -hmm. resolution cliffhanger. And, you know, kind of back to, to the other question about, you know, plans and, you know, how things work. It was interesting because in this issue, in the resolution of the cliffhanger, one of the bad guys gets shot and injured. Mm -hmm. And then we had an argument about issue four. Well, how does this guy's injury play into, you know, the story? And there was a train of thought that we don't really even need to see him again, that he just kind of disappears. And Mm -hmm. I was like, but but I want to know what the fallout from him getting injured is. Yeah. And we had a pretty long talk about, you know, what, you know, what, what do we need to see? And we ended up building a five page sequence that I already drew for the fourth issue with the resolution of this guy's injury. It's a big Mm -hmm. deal. We, 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 so I went and changed panels in issue three and then more, made more pages for issue four. And then, you know, there's, there's a punishment involved and a back history. And then of course we're like, well, who's this? And, and, you know, one of the writers said, you know, you, you drew this one character that's like a, like a guy with a huge acid tank for a body mm-hmm. and you've done nothing with him except he's in a few pinups and stuff just kind of in the background. Mm-hmm. And then, so we, we made a whole thing with this guy coming into the story and then for issue four, that we're going to do the acid tank man's backstory and an artist that I'm a huge fan of on Instagram and Facebook is going to draw that for Italy. And then we're going to let backers be in that story. So again, with these things, there's a lot of, you know, changing the plan during the process to fit what's going on and to fit, you know, the, the creative process working itself out. So even that all changed based on two discussions based on this guy getting shot or not getting shot in issue three. Well, it's important to have a, well, not a good conclusion, but, an entertaining conclusion to the cliffhanger from before. Cause once you're four sure. or five episodes or comic books or anything in people are going to start to catch on and think this isn't actually going anywhere. <laughs> so that that's important that you guys are thinking that hard about, okay, we left this cliffhanger. We need to make it mean something mm-hmm. because if someone tunes into oh. the next comic book and it sucks, then they're not going to tune into the third one. Well, and especially if you're, if you're using cliffhangers to draw, like to keep people entertained, like you're mm-hmm. using that to hook them, to bring them into the next edition. And then you never resolve that cliffhanger. It's like, well, they waited around and then they're like, well, it's like that text message simulator. Have you ever seen those where it's just perpetually going on and on and on? And sure. it's just don't, yeah. <laughs> Don't go in there. Why not? I'll tell you later. <laughs> Wait, what? No, run. <laughs> anyway. I mean, that, yeah. one yeah. thing I'll say about that, and it's interesting because I'm 44 years old and I have, I don't know, probably close to a thousand Marvel books that I kind of grew up with, like Hulks and X-Men and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Spider-Man. And, and I love all those books. And I, at a certain point in my life, I, I just kind of stopped reading all of them not for any, you know, I'm mad. Like it just kind of, it's kind of a piece of gum. You chew it. And after a while you you spit it out. Mm -hmm. Um, I still appreciate all those classic books, but the biggest problem I have with them is that they never end. Like there is no end to the Peter Parker narrative. There's no end. They're just kind of endless kind of stories. And I think everyone kind of just checks out after a while. Oh yeah. Um, Unless Mm -hmm. you're insane and you just feel the need to read every (laughs) Spider-Man book ever, ever written. 
So, I mean, my opinion about any story is that at any point they do lose a shelf life and there has to be a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Uh, I always go back to what I feel is the greatest story ever told is the Odyssey. I think it's the greatest book. Great. I just think it's awesome. And it ends, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like there's a beginning and there's an end. There's no Odyssey two or Odyssey three. It's like, this is the end. Yeah. Um, and that, and that gives it, it's part of its power is that there's an end to the story. And, Eventually, there needs to be an end. The Lords of the Cosmos, we're not near it yet, but there there needs to be an end, and we have a pretty good idea of what that is going to be. But mm-hmm. eventually, it will get stale. The cliffhangers will get old. Uh, the stories will get old, and it'll be played out. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, and again, but it's, you know, it's it's one of those issues with storytelling. I think things do need to have some finality to it, and it has to go somewhere. If it's just a, if it's just an endless uh, circle jerk, so to speak. You know, you 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 do get tired of it. And like mm-hmm. I said, I, I read all the classic Marvel stuff as a kid, um, enjoyed it all. And I just kind of quietly got tired of all of it <laughs> because it just nev- it just never ends. Yeah, well, it's that way with any form of entertainment. How many TV shows out there where you say, oh, you watch the first six seasons of Dexter, but don't watch seven and eight where they just go too long or watch the office long. but don't watch robert california supernatural or supernatural going into its 127th season right now just <laughs> it just keeps going and the shows that are most highly acclaimed like breaking bad or the wire five seasons and done yeah. and that's it there's an yeah there's yeah. a final thing to it of course breaking bad's putting out a movie now <laughs> but it's just i don't know it's it's better if you End it early, like Barry Sanders did in the NFL, because he's the greatest running back of all time. I'm off on a <laughs> tangent. To, but... to See, Jason, I think you hit the nail on the head there for me because, like, I've I have thought so many times that, like, man, I'm going to get into comics. I'm going to get into. Com- this is my time right here. I'm going to start reading comics. But it's like I never know where to start because I'm the kind of person who, if I start a TV show, I have to start it and finish it at the beginning yes like and with comics it's like well where do you what do you consider to be the start the first edition of you know oh. captain america so i have to go back like 70 <laughs> well, years there's only worth three of, comics. of those in existence <laughs> anyway <laughs> well and what you've just hit on and again being 44 i've seen certain things and i remember as a kid dc was so crazy with all their continuities that they actually hired george perez Mm-hmm. Uh, and they did uh, a 12 issue maxi series called Crisis on Infinite Earths. Does it ring a bell to any of you guys? I have heard of that. No, I have not. not for me, no. <laughs> no, I have. I so, have. W- what they did was they said, wow, our continuity is insane. And for people such as yourself that said, where do I start? Their whole thing was to say, wow, we've got 30 different continuities. None of this stuff makes any sense. They acknowledged that it all made no sense and that. They actually built this really complicated, layered storyline to say, hey, we've got to clear it all up and just have one DC. Mm-hmm. And they, they really did an outstanding job of, one, acknowledging how stupid it was and how complicated it was for readers. And then they, they did a narrative device of you know addressing all, all, all the universes and all the realities – and uh, then they had a character that starts destroying them and everything else. And by the end of it, there's just one Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was in like 1986, perhaps, 87, 86, something of that nature. Uh, the art was amazing. Uh, George Perez, every panel is a masterpiece. Uh, Supergirl dies. The Flash dies. Like it was like this big thing. And. You know, DC was like, now we've, we've got a clean slate to say, here's for, for John Q. Public, if you just want to say, I want to read DC, ne- start here. That's- and I think, unfortunately, in the years since, they've just gone all over the place anyway, because, you know, <laughs> yeah. the too. but it, it's, yeah, like how, how, how do you start reading Batman? I mean, like, I... Like, I, I don't even know how to answer that question because where do you start? And mm-hmm. the longer these things go, you know, it's like well, Spider-Man. Is it Peter Parker? Is it Miles Morales? Is it Spider-Verse? Is it the movies? Is it, you know, the the, the original run of comics? Oops, they reset it. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. it, it just becomes so complicated to even to know that I think it, it also turns off new readers because it, it can be so overwhelming and 
I hate to say it, a lot of comic book uh, super fans are elitist snobs that that make this stuff unaccessible or or will mock you for even asking a genuine question like that to say, well, what do you, you know, I mean, you should know, you know. Yeah. And I think that's a problem that comics have as a community. Um, and I've seen it for years where it's like, one, it's, it is an issue. Two, the publishers don't do a good job of addressing it. And three, the fans that really know the stuff aren't really good at helping new readers get on board. And of, of course, if there is a long term reader that likes new readers and says, that's not me, I apologize. But my experience is that a lot of super readers of comics are a little snobby and a little elitist. No, you're right. Because if you're reading a comic and you ask a question, or if you say, hey, I liked this, you're like, wait, you liked. You liked that Batman? Wait. Yeah, you, I know if you like You like Bruce that. Wayne Batman? You didn't like, or just, I don't know. There's all the different people that play Batman. I actually just had this conversation where someone said, what, what would have happened if Batman's parents didn't die? I said, well, there's actually a comic book out there with that story arc. Anything you can think of. Yeah. It's just, it's out there. And so, yeah, DC has a multiverse of different things that can happen. Well, and then, like, what, what really gets me is when they'll have multiple storylines happening at the same time for one character. Like with yeah. even even Marvel has done that because like Wolverine has always been one of my favorite superheroes. And like I've always wanted to go and like read some of the X-Men comics. But it's like now he kind of has like his like and it, I guess it's like with him and Hulk and they're like in space or something like, like that. Like a sitcom I, best friends. Yeah, I don't know. Kind of, it's like know? there's all these crazy and it's like wh- there's like four or five different storylines for him all being made right now by different writers. It's like, so, well, what? So I, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll lay it out to you what I think about what you just said. It's kind of depressing, so bear with me. So Marvel. We're very good at that. You're going to fit right <laughs> in. Yeah, we're very good at that. Right. Very depressing. So, so they're part of a big publicly traded company. And the only goal of a big publicly traded company is to make more profit for the shareholders, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. So if you look at big companies that don't make comic books, like look at Exxon, 3M, Ford Motor Company, whatever. So they all want to do is make more stuff to sell. So, you know, Exxon sells fuel, you know, 3M sells safety products, sandpaper, that was their MO, Ford sells cars, right? Yeah. So Marvel, by extension, Disney sells entertainment, Mm -hmm. right? So if they're looking at what makes money and, you know, whatever the flavor of the month is, is like, hey, everyone seems to like Punisher. OK, and it's funny because I used to laugh because Punisher, there was a time he was in every freaking book and they just killed him <laughs> with overexposure where it's like, hey, wow, we made a Punisher book and it sold a lot. Of people seem like Punisher. Right now, the creative, the artist would say, hmm. The reason that Punisher is popular is because we don't use him very much. He's like seasoning. Mm-hmm. Right. He's like a little bit of paprika on your on your chicken. It's mm-hmm. tasty. You're not going to eat a whole plate of paprika. That's ridiculous. You throw <laughs> up. Right. The artist understands that the artist understands that sometimes less is more. Right. Yeah. You don't need to show me everything. Pull it back. Leave one more, more. Right. Now, do you think Exxon thinks that way about selling fuel? No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. They sell more fuel. Right. Sell more cars, sell more sandpaper. Right? So. If Marvel, you know, their executives are like, wow, uh, we, we put out a book with, uh, you know, Wolverine, it sold more, put them in more books. And those, those people, they're, they're not there to make art per se. They're there to make money. Yeah. So they just could say, hey, <clears throat> we need three more Mar- Wolverine books. There was a time Punisher, I think, had five monthly books in the 90s. Jeez. Like in, in every other book, it's like Punishers in this month, Punisher. Uh, and it just it just destroyed the character. Spider-Man was that way for a while. Punisher was that way for a while. Wolverine has been like that for a good long while. And they kill these characters because it's just too much. Mm-hmm. It's not that so, way in any form of other form of entertainment where all right, well, I mentioned Breaking Bad earlier. You could you're not going to watch Walter White cook meth and then walter white open a baking shop and then like five different series going on at the same time walter well, white or, yeah crosses but, the country and, and look, i i don't know all the legal the legal information on it but i think vince gilligan must have some control over it 
because he's the one calling the shots on break, mm-hmm. like all the breaking bad stuff. Mm-hmm. So if you look at Calvin and Hobbes, right? Yeah. How many times have you seen legitimate Calvin and Hobbes merchandise? Never. Because Bill Watterson was like, you know, this is about a childhood dream. And if we sell toys that don't act like the dream, then it ruins the experience for new children. So I never want to sell merchandise. Yeah. Now, if they could, if you could sell Calvin and Hobbes stuff, like legitimate, not just peeing on the Ford logo or whatever. <laughs> yeah. It would sell like crazy. Oh, yeah. You're probably looking at hundreds of millions of dollars a year in merch, Mm -hmm. like shirts, toys, you know, pops, whatever. Now, who's in charge of Calvin and Hobbes? Bill Watterson. 100% he's in charge. And that guy's an artist. Mm -hmm. So he's sitting there thinking like, man, I don't want to ruin a a kid's dream. (laughs) Now, if Disney owned Calvin and Hobbes, do you think they would say, oh, man, that... You know, so, (laughs) you know, Breaking Bad in many ways is a lot like Calvin and Hobbes. The person that made it up has the control of it. Yeah. Whereas like Todd McFarlane created Venom, but he did it as a work for hire. So Marvel owned Venom, Mm -hmm. not Todd. So I never knew that. Well, yeah, when he, he, he made Venom working for Marvel. So like he made that for them. Right. It would be like if you were a scientist working for 3M and you invented some amazing product, they might say, hey, thanks. Here's a ten thousand dollar bonus. And they go out and make a hundred million dollars selling a widget. Yeah. Because you did it while you work for them. I'm curious now if he made Venom prior to or after uh, conceiving the idea for Spawn, because now now that I know that he made both because Todd McFarlane made Spawn, right? I can answer that question. If you read Todd's interviews and stuff, he said he spawn was an idea he had as a kid. Oh, wow. Okay. Cause there's, he, I see like he, visual he, similarities he, now, now that, now that you mentioned that. Well, I think spawn was always in the back of his head, but he never, if he would have put spawn in a Marvel book, when he worked for Marvel, they probably would have owned it based on whatever the, the legal mumbo jumbo is. Right. Yeah. I think part of his, dissatisfaction and why he left Marvel to start image was because of things like, Hey, here's venom. It's this amazing idea that everyone likes. And you know, he got like a paycheck, not like ownership. Right. Right. And I think, I think, you know, I I think that's stuck in his craw because Marvel's made a mint off of that idea, which was really his. So, you know, again, going back to breaking bad, and Calvin and Hobbes, both of those are owned by the people that made them up. And it's amazing how respectful those two properties are treated. Yeah. Because the guy that made them up owns them. Again, like it isn't like, well, AMC owns Breaking Bad, so now they want to have a new five Breaking Bad shows. It would suck. Oh, yeah. And the reason we're all excited for the movie is, and I, by the way, for the record, I love Breaking Bad. I'm super excited about the movie. Oh, me too. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I, I've been watching chatter about it, and I saw this guy. I said, well, I think it's going to be dumb. There's no story they could tell. And you know what? And this other person, on I think it was Twitter I was reading, they said, you know, I, I, I kind of feel the same way, but Vince Gilligan has never done a bad job. He's even so, great you with know, Better Call Saul. I, oh, Better Call Saul is great. Mm-hmm. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. This, this other guy just writes back. He says, he's never screwed up. So even though we can't see the angles because we're just plebes, like I trust Vince Gilligan to do a great job because he's never screwed up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you sit point. down, you sit down and watch the first season. I, Cause I remember with breaking bad, it took me, uh, it took me until like a year or two after the show had wrapped to actually watch it because I watched the first episode or two and I was like, this is really boring. This is stupid. And then I just like, went away from it and like once i fo- once enough people told me like you have to go back and watch this show and i went and sat and watched it what he was able to do with that series was amazing so like yeah like i'm 100 and and what you were talking about earlier this is this is perfectly cyclical here you were talking about cliffhangers earlier one of the biggest issues i always had with breaking bad is i wanted to know what happened to jesse <laughs> 
Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is him resolving that cliffhanger. Jesse and Huel. Yeah. No, just kidding, but Huel <laughs> sitting on that couch. <laughs> hey, I want to know what happened to Huel. I know. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, it's so funny. You know, again, there's so much stupid conversation. Someone's like, well, Jesse's going to get revenge on the people that hurt him. And then, of course, another person chimes in. You, you do know that they killed the neo-Nazi guys they're all at dead. the end of it. The, like, <laughs> yeah. They're all dead. There's no one, like, they're not there to take revenge on. He strangled the guy to death that, that killed the, his girlfriend w- with chains. Like, we don't know the story. It, but, yeah. you know, again, like, it's interesting. There was a show that I loved before Breaking Bad called The Shield. I was oh, an yeah. FX show that, and there was talk a couple years ago uh, from uh, – crap uh the guy that made the show Sean I can't think of his name uh really good creator and uh he'd said hey the shield's been off the air now for like 10 years and he's like I I've considered maybe going back and doing a movie or a series because he's like what happened to Vic what happened to Ronnie and he rattled off a bunch of characters and it kind of never went anywhere, but I was very curious because that was a very well done show in my opinion. And I was curious, like, yeah, what did happen to Ronnie? You mm-hmm. know, what did happen to, you know, uh, Vic? And, you know, of course, the the creator had rattled off a couple ideas of what he thought the characters might be doing. Uh, you know, like, you know, is Vic now like a soldier of fortune or a bounty hunter? Is Ronnie now clicked up with like uh, a white supremacy gang in prison to survive and he wants to get back at Vic? And I was like, Whoa, I'm totally invested in this again, <laughs> just, just, ba- just, just based on this random interview. But like a lot of these really cool creative projects, it just never, it's just nothing. But so this thing with Breaking Bad is is almost like, holy crap, like this is like the the fan dream. And not like, hey, here's some D-list creator trying to do it. It's the, it's the man. It's, it's Vince. the same people. Yeah. Right. You know, it isn't like, I'll do it. And you're like, eh, Jason, like you're not, you know, we want that's that's not breaking bad if you do it yeah and i would agree yeah i don't want to keep i don't want to keep beating this dead horse but uh (laughs) i I think the thing that disappoints me most and talking about cash grabs and stuff like that is when you you watch a series where the show's creators um you know they just they want it to end and the studio doesn't let them because they're making money off of it. And so you end up having characters leaving and, you know, producers leaving to go take on other things. And then they then they decide they want to have a spinoff. And the spinoff, <clears throat> like, you know, it's got one of the characters from the original show. You get Joey None of friends. the editors and none of the producers you get from the original season show. Season nine of Scrubs. Yeah. You get- <laughs> and it's just like you lose all of that creative that made it a good series, book, you know, comic whatever to begin with because it's not what they had initially wanted mm-hmm. so let me roll it back to my whole interview because hey it's kickstarter yeah yes. <laughs> i was i was trying to find a that's what i was trying to do <laughs> because <laughs> you're, you're I'll, the creator I'll, I'll yeah you're you're yeah. the creator and you're answering to yourself much like vince gilligan so now we're back to where we started there we go <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna roll it back like it's an interesting time with comics because we are in a true democracy with comics right now and that anyone has the right to go make stuff because the technology exists to, to publish books at a reasonable price and, and access people. So it's, it's truly equality that anyone can make a book, you know, mm-hmm. teenage kid, old person, whatever. And if it's a good idea, the people can support it. And if the idea sucks, the people don't have to. And, I think it's a great time because, you know, years ago, if you said, I want to make a book, I, it just, I don't think it was physically feasible to do it just because the technology wasn't there to, to make it happen. So it was like, here's books from these two publishers, DC and Marvel. And you'd see a whisper of, you know, a couple independents. I loved heavy metal magazine, still do. Um, but that was it. So you might have an idea and say, I have an idea. And it's like, okay, cool. It's not going to go anywhere because it just there's not a, a voice. There's no way for you to get out. And I love the fact that anyone can can put their shit oh, – don't want to swear – can put their stuff together and go out and say, I have an idea, and I'm going to make it, and we're going to put, put it out. Yeah. Right? 
And so people like me, and, and really one of the, the big things that started Lords of the Cosmos was I remember I was uh, at a store in 2013 and DC had put out uh, a Masters of the Universe comic they had gotten licensed for. And I grabbed the copy off the shelf. I looked at it. It was so bad. And my and I just, this is garbage. Mm-hmm. I, I just was offended by the art. I was offended by the writing. I bought it. I wanted to take it home and just dissect it. Mm-hmm. And I the more I looked at it, I was just disgusted with this book. And I actually called some friends and I was like, this is like the worst book I've ever read in my life. This DC Masters. I was like, I hate it. I was like, I hate it so much because I love He-Man and Masters of the Universe. And I was like, I hate this book so much because it deserves better. And then, of course, I started saying, well, if it was me and I, you know, (laughs) and I could make the book, I would do this and I would do that. And I had all these ideas and all these thoughts. And, of course, you can't work on Masters of the Universe um, just because you want to. Like one, you know, you have a rights holder mm-hmm. and then, you know, they're the gatekeeper to even say what the characters do or even so you can say, I want to work on the book. Okay, cool. We don't want you on the book because you're no, you know, you're nobody. Yeah. And, you know, that's where the Lords of the Cosmos, at least for me mentally, it was like, I'd, I'd like to do my own version of that genre. It's, it'd be like if you saw a Western, you say, I want to make a Western. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think it's great. That you can say, well, maybe I can't have Skeletor you know, in beast man and evil in, but I could have, you know, Umex obsidian and cannibal mm-hmm. and I could have them have their own adventures. And obviously if you're a fan of masters of the universe, you're going to read the Lords and be like, Oh yeah, I get it. I, I get what's going on here. And yeah. it's cool. It's a genre. <laughs> and you know, to me, it's great. It's a great time because I can do everything the way I want to do it. Mm-hmm. And if people like it, they can throw a couple dollars in the hat and say, you know what? I dig what you're doing. I like your vision. This is cool stuff. Or they can say, I think it's stupid. I don't like it. So to me, it's an exciting time because, again, we live in a true democracy of ideas that everyone's allowed to participate and you can succeed or fail based on the merits of your project. And, you know, again, we'll Lords of the Cosmos ever be as big as Masters of the Universe? Uh, I doubt it, but it doesn't even matter because I'm just how I get to make my own book. Yeah. So I had a you question. Know, oh, sorry. Yeah, go no, no, go go ahead. Continue. Well, my last thought on that is, and, and I can be as a, a big of a stickler on the what I want to see with with the only people that I'm beholden to are my fans, mm-hmm. and I and I dig that. And at a bigger level, guys like Vince Gilligan. I love what he's doing because he's treating his property the way he wants to do it. Cause like I saw someone saying, Hey, uh, on better call Saul, uh, is the older brother not dead? And he, he was like, I hate when you show a character obviously dying and they come back. He gets one of the cheapest moves in writing and I will never do it. He goes, <laughs> dead. He goes, I'll make it very clear. He's dead. And I was like, you know what? He's a fan because he probably saw that stuff happen on his shows and he doesn't like it, but because he's the boss, that's how he's going to run it. Yeah. But that's his stuff. So anyway, I, I dig that about him and, and I try to run my ship the same way. Mm-hmm. Go ahead with your question. Hey, this, this was from like a while ago before we got off on the breaking bad stuff. And we were talking about that, like the new people that, that you brought in to help. Um, mm-hmm. Whenever you're bringing somebody new in, um, what kind of like freedom do you give them with, with your projects and things like what kind of like now is, is he an illustrator as well? Or is like, how, what is exactly is he doing with the whole project? Did you say you said he was. So Zach drew a 16 page sequential for us. Okay. And, and that's a great question because one of the great things about bringing in new people is it's fresh blood. It's fresh ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a fine line you have to walk between staying on model, so to speak, and then saying, I'm going to let you spread your wings. Because if you start to handcuff guys too tight, you know, again, their work's going to start to suffer. Mm -hmm. Right. So with that story, um, we have a character who's a plant. that's like a flower that lives in a mechanical body. And, one of the writers said, I have an amazing concept for what this character's story is. And I'm like, what's the concept? Mm -hmm. And he's like, what if this plant is like a quarter million years old? And he's like, I am legend. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, what if there's this whole plant society and this guy is like the king and he's run it very poorly and he's run it into all these wars and he doesn't see the problems in their society of like intelligent plants. And they're before the rise of man on this world. Mm -hmm. 
And I was like, what? I was like, that's that's like deep. So I'm like, you want this story to be a quarter million years of the past? And he's like, but it'll tie into the present story by the end. That's really so cool. I was like, that, <laughs> that's that's I was like, I love it. But so we we tasked this this young guy to say, hey, so <clears throat> there's a cactus kingdom and a flower kingdom and like this rotting kingdom, and like you have to design all these creatures and like their cities and everything else and make it tie into this stuff that's in a robot <laughs> yeah. and to his credit <clears throat> this guy designed all this stuff and had it all work into the present day but he was designing like plant soldiers and we were just like that's amazing like with like vine skeletons and all this stuff hmm. and like the works the works amazing and we just encouraged him to like just go with what you feel and try to roughly tie it into these models by the end so it ties into continuity mm-hmm. but giving him that freedom uh one of the guys has like venus flytrap dogs that he like six <laughs> people to kill him uh there's like a, there's like a, a a guy that's like corn <laughs> like literally he's like a, a, a violent ear of corn but it, it makes sense and it's like a a giant cactus that like stomps on people i miss that's... that veggie tales episode <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, so, so here's the thing if you have a true creative, a real one, a guy that yeah. can like envision things and, mm-hmm. and Zach's got the Zach's got whatever it is, I can tell you this this guy's got it. It's amazing because we gave him some really basic direction and asked him to make up like a sub universe in Lords of the Cosmos. Mm-hmm. And like he made it cooler than we ever thought it could be. And like getting the pages was just amazing because you're just like, wow, dude, this is better than I thought it could be. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, man. So again, or you can be a big stickler and say, Hey, that character has three strands of hair on their face. You drew two. (laughs) And it's like, is that really important in the big scheme of things? Like to me, it's all about letting your creatives run. And I believe that it's, it, it, I believe that diversity gives you strength. Uh, and in the case of this, that every artist is putting a little of their DNA into it, but we stick to model. We, we, we put enough in that you can identify it. And that's part of my job as like editor. It's like at the end, it's in the present day. And like Umex is fighting with Aegis, like the main hero and villain. I was like, you got to make sure you draw their logos and their outfits. He's like, oh, yeah, okay. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> you know, so I'll just chime with like little things like that that like just beats it back to, to where it needs to be. Yeah. So it's like, oh, yeah, that's Lords of the Cosmos. You're like, mm. yes. But Crazy Plant Kingdom, yeah, that, that ties in. But it doesn't need to be me slavishly yelling at him about well, the, the corn guy's this big. Now, one funny thing that came out of this was one of our other artists, Dave, was like, how big's this guy and how big's that guy? Then I was like, well, this guy's this tall. And he goes, dude, you need to go make a scale model sheet for these characters. It's too complicated. Mm-hmm. So I reached out to a guy at DeviantArt for France that does model layouts for characters for films and stuff, I guess. Yeah. And this guy, it took him all summer, but he designed two huge uh, files for us with every single character in color to scale by height from three feet tall to 120 feet in height. Oh, wow. <laughs> so those are going to be in this book because we're using them now to send to artists to say, here's your scale model sheet and color guides. That's something I've never thought of before, where if you're illustrating something and drawing pictures and you've had two characters that have never been in the same room together... You got to think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is this guy 5'10"? Is this guy well, seven foot tall? What is he? Mm-hmm. Let me tell you what happened. So Bug with a Shotgun debuts in this issue, and I did a variant cover for him. It's a wraparound, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought it'd be neat to show him in the air, like flying over an enemy base. So I drew him flying in the air, and like there's people on the ground pointing at him and pointing guns at him, but they're, like they're really small. Mm-hmm. So I showed it to David, the artist I just mentioned, and he looked at it. He said, well is this guy like a giant like Mothra? <laughs> but I'm like, well, no, he's like up in the air. Like, so if we were 80 feet in the air on a roof and like you were flying, we'd see you. And if like, you know, someone was on the ground, they'd seem really small. He goes, Oh, I guess he goes, just looks like he's a giant. Mm-hmm. I was like, Ooh, <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> so I showed it to other people. And they're like, well, he's a giant. Right. And I was like, well, no, he's like six feet long. I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, I thought he was a giant because those people are really small. I'm like, well, hold on. I was like, oh, <laughs> no. Oh, no. So I redrew it with like him shooting people like close up. Mm-hmm. 
and during that process is when all these questions that he was asking about scale, well, how big is this guy? How big is that guy? So yeah. in the new book, you every all the viewers are going to get the big charts in the book of like everybody. Oh, that's awesome. That'll, that'll help so, people too. So again, part of this, I never intended to do that. It never seemed to be an issue to me, but you got to listen. And you start mm-hmm. having talented people start questioning these things. Of, well, how big is this? And this is confusing. I don't see it. And it's like, you got to stop and say, wait, I can either A, be like, well, you don't get it. <laughs> or yeah. you can say, well, I got to listen to people that might be smarter than me. This must be an issue or you wouldn't bring it up. Mm-hmm. So maybe we need to address this beyond saying just cause. Yeah. So yes, it's a great, it's a great question. So I have one thing that I don't think that we've covered in, sure. this, in this whole conversation. We've covered a lot. Um, yeah. I don't think that we've covered how people can contact you. Oh, okay. Well, um, the easiest way these days in 2019 is probably just to, Find me on Instagram or Twitter. I'm just at Lennox Artist. Uh, you can email me through my website. Uh, there's a contact page there at jasonlennox.com. You can just email me at j at jasonlennox.com, which goes to my website uh, mailbox. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook. Uh, I'm at Jason uh, Lennox Illustrator on Facebook, or you can just friend my personal page if you like to see memes all the time. Uh, just <laughs> Jason Lennox <laughs> is on Facebook. Uh, but those are pretty much the easiest ways to get a hold of me. Um, and one thing I did want to say, because uh, you said about conventions, mm-hmm. um, at Baltimore Comic Con, this year I will have art in the Baltimore Comic Con yearbook, which is actually a big deal. So one of the one of the things with the planning of our Kickstarter was to launch it a week before Baltimore on the 12th. And then I will have art in the yearbook, which this year the theme was a comic book character from Europe called black sad. Who's kind of like a, a gumshoe detective. Who's a cat. <laughs> and the, the assignment for the yearbook was to draw one of your characters with black sad. So I drew mm-hmm. bug with a shotgun with black sad. And of course they both have their guns. So yeah. <laughs> if you're at Baltimore comic con, get a yearbook and I'll have, be happy to sign it for you. And we can talk about the Kickstarter at the event. So I wanted to make sure I gave that a little bit of a plug too. Cause it's going to be a fun show. And it was really exciting to get included in the yearbook this year with some really uh, fabulous, famous artists. Like I, when I saw who was in it, I was kind of like, whoa, the Hildebrand brothers are in it. <laughs> yeah. cool. And the Kickstarter is October 12th. That's when Correct. it kicks off. Yeah. And that'll yep. all that information, I'm sure, will be linked throughout your social media and everything. Yeah. And, and I think I sent you guys the link for the Kickstarter to go check it out yeah. now. Yep. Yeah. I've linked that when that link when the thing goes live will take mm-hmm. you right to it so you could even put that link up now for people to look at they can go okay. check it out yeah cool. yeah i wasn't sure if i was just like a preview for us i was actually going to ask you about that in email but i'm glad you brought that up that way i know that i can use that whenever we post the episode too and it'll take people right to that site well <clears throat> kickstarter's gotten smarter over the years because it used to be you had a preview link and then that link was no good when it went live so yeah. you couldn't like pre-plan for this so like I've let a lot of people look at the link because I want to get them excited about it, but we've gotten some really good feedback. Like, Hey, what about this? I'm like, Oh, cool. Let's make that change. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, cause one of my secrets is I just listen to everyone and do all their good ideas. And I just, people are like, that's smart. I'm like, cause I listen to people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're more than welcome to share that link with anybody. Um, they okay. can't hurt anything. You can check it out. They can even leave comments, which I read all the comments that people put up. There's like three or four comments on there. People can leave comments. Like one, one person was like, there's no hype video. Mm-hmm. And, <clears throat> There will be an animated video of Lords of the Cosmos when that thing launches. We're making it now. I'm pumped for that. So, so one of my friends, <laughs> one of my one of my childhood friends, makes professional videos, and it's almost done now. He's animated part of the comic book with like characters moving around with sound effects and stuff from our art. Mm-hmm. So we will have an animated intro opening. So it was funny because guys, like, you don't have a hype video. And I sent him the link to check it out, like secretly, and he was like, "Oh my god, this is amazing!" I was like, Come <laughs> on it. Don't you don't you think we all gonna have a hype video? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, feel free to link that. That'll go. That'll be the link when it goes live. But again, you can share it with your friends now. Say, check it out. What do you think? Have them leave comments. I mean, it, the, the more people that want to look at it, uh, the, the better. Oh, definitely. We could definitely do that. So was there was there anything else you? Uh... That we forgot about before we wrap this up? No, this is a really good interview. Awesome. Um, a lot of great questions. And uh, 
I appreciate you guys, you know, supporting me and supporting the project and just being excited about this, this book. Cause it's going to be a lot of fun. It's a really good book. Um, I think people are going to like it. So I hope you guys can check it out. Hope you guys can back it. Um, we're going to have a couple tiers where people can be in issues four and five, like drawn in the book. So we actually, one real quick anecdote, we had a thing for characters to be in the book for issue three. And one of my uh, friends who's a writer, David, um, who does a book called Lovecraft PI, he and I wanted to make um, Lords of the Cosmos in like a World War II action movie. That would be <laughs> And it was supposed to be <laughs> awesome. in issue three. And it ended up being a 26 page script. Uh-huh. And we were like, this is ridiculous. We can't even get this done in time. And what do we do with it? And that's the one for the backers that back uh, through is- issue two kickstarted to be an issue three. And we decided to push that back and we'll cut it in half, put half an issue five, half an issue six. <clears throat> we told all those backers, we're like, here's the deal. And we offered to let them all read the script if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of them are like, I don't want to read it. I want to be surprised. But we did have one fan that sat and read the whole script end to end. And she was like, this this is this is awesome. She's mm-hmm. like, this, this is nonstop <laughs> action. This kicked my ass. So we decided to open up two more slots to be in that story. It's called Pulse. Um, it's Again, it's a World War II kaiju story set in the Lords of the Cosmos universe that was it took David and I about five months to write. Wow. So <clears throat> we've got that kind of cooking. And then our artist from Italy, Sasha, will put you in another story for issue four, where we learn the origin of the acid tank man um, and why he's why he is a robot uh, body person. Mm-hmm. Um, and that story is basically if Saving Private Ryan was in Lords of the Cosmos with like gigantic creatures unloading uh, troops onto a beach with organic weapons and robots and things like that. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> that's for issue four, too. So lots of weird, exciting stuff for the fans if they want to get in future issues, too. So it'll all be on Kickstarter when it launches. Yeah, we'll definitely give that. Uh, I'll check that out actually this evening. I want to look at all that, the preview of that and everything. And I like how you're thinking yeah. that far ahead to like even issue six which is, you know, smart planning. So we, we really appreciate you coming on, Jason, again. Yeah, this is a very good episode. Great episode, guys. I really appreciate it. Let me know when the episode goes live and I'll let people know. And like I said, at Lennox Artist on Instagram and Twitter, Jason Lennox Illustrator on Facebook, and then jasonlennox.com for my website. And then just the letter J at jasonlennox.com if you want to write me an email. So I'm easy to get a hold of. All right. And we'll have everything. So if anybody listening, we'll have all that linked in the description below too. That way you don't have to type yeah. it out. You can just click on it. It'll shoot you right over to any of those sites. So Yeah. And, and you know, if you guys are looking at the Kickstarter and you see something that uh, you're like, man, what about this? Just put a comment in there and I'll read it. So, I mean, all, all, com- all comments are, you know, I, I want that feedback. I, I never want people to, to think that uh, they shouldn't speak up because there's so many good ideas that you get from people or even mistakes Hey, you misspelled a word. Shit. You know, okay. Um, so the more the merrier, and feel free if you see something in that Kickstarter, let me know. All right. We will. All right. Thanks again, Jason. Thank you for your time. Yeah, guys, have a have a great day. Thanks again. See you. You too. Take it easy. Mm, bye-bye. Cause this is our home. Cause this is right.